Hello YouTube and welcome to the more or less part 1 of a video that was much requested. Timeline of Emperors. And today I'm joined by Avarti in the second part of our collaboration that we promised 4 months ago. Today we're going to be talking about the Mede Emperors. A dynasty of emperors that, against all odds, managed to bring the empire back from the brink of destruction. So without further ado, let's roll the intro and kick off. Most people see the Mede dynasty as somehow unworthy or lesser than the Septim dynasty. They, see the, they say that the Medes made the empire into a shit show and that their emperors are cowards. And yet I very much doubt that since all the facts tell us exactly the contrary. So let's start at the beginning when Titus Mede I entered the picture following the Storm Crown Interregnum. At this time the empire had completely fallen apart. We don't know much about this time other than the fact that almost all the provinces had gained near independence from the empire and that even some Cyrodiilic cities had become city-states. It is stated that Breville and Leowin actually became independent city-states during this time and that they were frequently at war with one another over sea trade superiority. As far as we know, Valenwood, Alanor and Hammerfell had already formally left the empire at this point and Blackmarsh and elsewhere no longer listened to imperial authority at all. Furthermore, Skyrim, High Rock and Morrowind and even large portions of Cyrodiil no longer listened to the authority of the Elder Council. We also know that by this time Titus Mede I had been, to begin with, a soldier in an outlaw army, then a warlord and after that a Clovian king. We can therefore speculate that Clovia, while still formerly a part of the empire under Titus Mede, also did not listen to the authority of the Elder Council at this time. So the empire at this time was more or less just the imperial city, as well as few territories it claimed it controlled. The empire in its entirety at this time was led by a Nibbanese man called Thuls the Gibbering. We know next to nothing about Thuls other than the fact he was a weak emperor. By this time Titus Mede I already wanted to claim the imperial throne but, for whatever reason, the older council staunchly refused. According to some sources we have, the Elder Council would apparently rather have a weak Lebanese ruler than a Clovian usurper. Titus Mede, however, had a plan. Together with his associate in the Elder Council, a man named Hirem, he managed to convince the Elder Council to see him more as a liberator than a conqueror. After Mede convinced the Elder Council, Emperor Thuls the Gibbering decided to arm the Imperial City afraid of a coup. But things had already shifted out of his favour since Titus had already massed his armies ready to take the Imperial City. And he did. Titus I took the Imperial City by force with an attacking army of less than a thousand men and it was then he was crowned Emperor of the Empire, albeit a weak empire. Titus' reign began with the reunification of the Empire. It is stated in the novel The Infernal City that Titus Mede often held speeches to his people of a glorious future in which Tamiya would be reunited again. He dedicated the first few years of his reign to rebuilding the Imperial Army and reconquering the provinces. He first reconquered Cyrodiil, using those troops to reinforce his rule in the provinces that were still formerly part of the Empire but had not listened to Imperial authority anymore. He then rebuilt the Imperial Army and reconquered Hammerfell, Valenwood and somehow managed to seize back control of Alanor, of the Somerset Isles. The Empire was now whole again, except for Black Marsh and elsewhere. Titus I made great progress in healing Tamriel. The only problem he faced was the Talmor. 
At one point in the year 22 of the Fourth Era, the Thalmor seized control of the Somerset Isles completely and renamed it to Eleanor. At this moment a cold war began. While Black Mars and elsewhere did not have any hostile intentions against the Empire, the Thalmor did. Titus was therefore one of the leaders in, Tem in the Temrielic Cold War that would continue far into the Fourth Era, until the Great War began. His rule would after that be defined by the, uh, by the rebuilding of the human provinces and trying to aid Morrowind. But there too he started losing grip on the province as the rebuilding powers there were not very content with the imperial rule. Officially Morrowind would remain part of the empire but the imperial rule there would be weakened severely. Another big part of his rule was the proxy war over Fallenwood. After the Thalmor coup in the Somerset Isles the state of Eleanor tried to gain control over, the, over Fallenwood as well to later reinstate the Old Mary Dominion. This proxy war came to a climax in the year 29 of the Fourth Era, when the Thalmor finally managed to overthrow the Imperial-backed government and exchange it for a Thalmor-backed government. But this did not mean the end of this proxy war in Valenwood. In the book To the Infernal City, we actually learn that this proxy war also continued far into the Fourth Era, as the Imperials kept supplying the Bosman rebels and sending agents into Valenwood, under the command of Titus I. Unfortunately, the grip of Eleanor was too strong on the province, and at some point between the year 40 and well, the year 171, the rebellion in Valenwood was rooted out by the Thalmor. Also stirring in Cat Tamriel's Cold War were the talks in Blackmarsh. Both the Empire and the Old Mary Dominion presumably had talks with, the, with Blackmarsh and the NC Heel about supporting them against the other party, but neither of them gained the upper, upper hand, since the NC Heel were mostly nationalists and isolationists. This is everything factual we know about the rule of Titus Mead I, because the Elder Scrolls novels end there, in the year 40 of the Fourth Era. But we do know something about his style of ruling. We know that he formed his own KGB-like secret service, known as the Penitus Oculatus. For more about them, I recommend watching my video of a few days ago, if you want to know more about them. He also reformed the imperial government itself. He actually initiated ministries, taking on minister, like a prime minister and minister of war, thereby weakening the power of the elder council. This is all we know about Titus I. Quite a lot more than is mentioned mostly, since people have mostly not read the novels. Therefore, a lot of people also don't know yet about the next in line for the Mead dynasty, Atribus Mead. Atribus Mede was the son of Titus Mede and therefore crown prince of the empire. He thought himself a hero as he apparently won a lot of daring battles and did a lot of good charitable things yet this is not completely true. Unbeknownst to him every battle his father had sent him to fight was staged. Not unlike a WWE match the outcome had already been decided before Atribus turned up. Fundamentally his life was a lie. This was all done for the purpose of giving the Imperial citizens a hero to look up to, a paragon to admire within the administration. In reality however, Achibus' skills were very limited. The only reason the prince had not died as of yet was because of his guard unit which was one of the best in the empire. The prince only allowed people into his guard if he could best them in combat, but this made it so easy that every initiation fight with him was also staged so that people could actually join the guard unit. Every single person of his guard unit was told to let Atribus win, therefore bolstering the man's own image of himself. Since Atribus thought himself a hero, he actually had a great sense of duty, but all the fake battles in Vandur definitely gave him something of an ego. Despite this, Atribus still possessed a great deal of compassion and love. This becomes painfully clear in the story of the Elder Scrolls novels. As in the year 40 of the 4th era, a floating city appears over Black Marsh and Atribus gets contracted by a girl trapped in the city, Anega Hoynart, a Breton, and his heroic instincts and his weakness for women caused him to want to rush to Black Marsh to stop the threat of this floating city, Umbriel, that kills everything in its path. Unfortunately on their way there, one of Atribus' guards betrays him and together with a band of mercenaries kills all of the guards and then captures Prince Atribus to sell him as a slave in Elsewhere. He later wakes up in Elsewhere and as he tries to battle his captors, it becomes painfully clear again how unskilled he is. His captor, the rogue guardsman, tells him the truth about himself and he would rather not believe it. It, however, did create a suspicion in him about himself and this would ultimately lead to him facing the truth but we will talk about that later. 
he gets rescued by Saul, a Dunmer mercenary who single-handedly kills all of his captors. Saul also has the aim of bringing down Umbriel, and thus they would travel together. Under Saul, Atribus finally faces the truth about himself and is devastated. He finally realises he is not the man from the stories and almost collapses in internal agony. At this time, he is again contracted by Aneka, and while not telling her the truth, the conversation motivates him again. Saul later teaches him a thing or two about the world and about combat and tells him that while he might not be the man from the stories, he can still become that being. These words motivate Atribus to continue the journey and together they leave for Umbu. Saul and Atribus encounter a band of rogue Khajiit. They've been banned from the cities and elsewhere for not aligning with the ideals of the government. And they strike a deal with Atribus and Saul to be their bodyguards. If Atribus and Saul go to the city of women to buy some moon sugar, they do, however, not reveal Atribus' identity as everyone thinks he's dead. When they leave the Khajiits and go to women, Saul decides to steal the money they obtained from the Khajiit for moon sugar and just continue on their journey. But Atribus makes him change his mind and they go to women to actually buy the moon sugar, as in his opinion, stealing from the innocent is not fit in any situation. When they return with the moon sugar, the Khajiits have been trapped by mercenary guards from women tasked with upholding the law that rogue Khajiits cannot trade for moon sugar in the proximity of cities. Atribus, however, notices that the captain is a Colovian and still wears a pin obtained from an Imperial mission. To be more specific, the very same unit his father captured the Imperial city with. He then reveals his identity, and out of respect for the Emperor, the captain lets them and the Khajiit go. The Khajiit are understandably very grateful and they say a lesser man would have ran away with our money or just left us to die by the hands of the soldiers. They then decide to follow Achibus and Saul in their journey to destroy Umbriel. After a series of long adventures that Imperial will tackle in an Umbriel video he has planned, Achibus and Anne Coinart, with the help of Saul and an Argonian named Glyn and the Penitus Oculatus agent Colin, they manage to defeat the master of Umbriel and send it back to oblivion where it came from. After this, we know Aneg and Atribus become romantically involved, and it may be assumed that Atribus ascended to the throne after his father, and it can also be assumed that he became a righteous emperor, since he has a great sense of duty towards his people and his country. After this, we know not what happened to the Empire, other than that elsewhere officially joins the Dominion after the Void Knights in the year 115, after another 15 years of presumed proxy war by the Empire and elsewhere, as both the Dominion and the Empire fight for influence in elsewhere ever since the Void Knights ended. This proxy war has probably been initiated under the rule of Emperor Atribus, Atribus Mede, since his father would have been over 150 years old near the end of the year 100. By this time, Atribus Mede would be near the end of his rule, since the Void Knights ended in the year 100, which, in which Atribus would actually be 82 years old. Therefore, it can also be that the proxy war in Elsewhere was initiated by, an other, by another Mede Emperor, one we don't yet know of. So now we are actually entering an area of heavy speculation. How many emperors reigned between the rule of Emperor Atribus Mede and Emperor Titus Mede II, we meet in Skyrim. So let's assume that Emperor Atribus Mede and Empress Anneek Ronghart got their firstborn child around the year 48. The year Atribus Mede would become 30 years old. Seems like a reasonable time. Let's just for convenience call this son Atribus II. Remember, this is not canon, just I'll give him just a name for sake of this video. By the, by the time of the end of the Void Knights, this would mean that Atribus Mede II would be 52 years old. A reasonable age to become Emperor, I think. Therefore, we can conclude that the proxy war in Elsewhere was probably initiated by either Atribus I of, or our speculated Atribus II. So let's get back to what we know. We know that Titus Mead II ascended to the throne in the year 168, probably after the last Mead Emperor died. It could also be of other causes, but for the sake of this video we just keep it at a natural death. So in the year 168, Atribus II would have been around 120 years old, which does not seem too realistic. So probably, if we go out from this scenario, there has been yet another Mede Emperor between those, which would mean that Emperor Atribus Mede II also would have another son that would probably have been born around the time that Atribus Mede II would be 30 years old. 
Let's just call this son for sake of this video Sephora's Mead. Again, a made up name just for speculation purposes. Which would mean that Emperor Sephora's Mead would be 90 years old by the time Titus Mead II came to rule. Yet 90 years old is a respectable age for Emperor Sephora's Mead, so perhaps there has been another emperor between those. But again, this is all speculation, so for the sake to keep this video short, we just keep it with. So, to sum up. As far as we know, there must have been at least 5 Mede Emperors since the beginning of the dynasty. 3 we know for certain, and 2 we speculate and just gave a name for purpose of this video. Again, nothing canon. So, I've lined them out in this convenient little family tree. First, Titus Mede. Then, his son, Atrebus Mede, with his Empress Anaik. Third, Atrebus Mede II. Speculated. Fourth, Sephiroth Mede. Also speculated. And fifth and final, Titus Mead II. There are some more people that we know of are from the Mead bloodline, namely Vittoria Vici, cousin of Titus Mead II, her mother Alexia Vici, aunt of the Emperor Titus Mead II, sister of Sephora's Mead, and daughter of Atribus Mead II. And finally, there's the brother of Titus Mead I. Well, actually, he is unnamed, we know nothing about him other than that he has been kept under surveillance by the Planetus Oculatus, and he had a hunting lodge built in a small town in Cyrodiil. Other than that, there's nothing we know about him. So let's finish this video with Emperor Titus Mede II. As we know, there are conflicting reports about his current state of well-being. Some say that he was assassinated by the Dark Brotherhood, while others say that he's been living for a few more years and that the Skyrim Dark Brotherhood has been destroyed. On a side note, not many people know that, but you can destroy the Dark Brotherhood in Skyrim. I'd suggest you Google it. That being said, what exactly do we know about this? Because for many people, Titus Mede is a controversial emperor. We know about the first couple years of his rule, and that they were plagued by infighting in Hammerfell between the crowns and the forebears. Other than that, we know no next to nothing about his rule before the Great War. The only thing we would like to know is that the proxy war and elsewhere, which did turn to the Odmo Dominion's favour, probably was not yet over. Probably at this time, the proxy war that had been started by Achebus Mede is more of a silent rebellion. And I speculate that probably the Empire under Titus Mede II does no longer support the rebellion actively, maybe only in the form of intel, but no longer in the form of the Penitus Oculatus agents, or weapons, or supplies, or anything like that. So then, shit happens. In the year 171, the Great War begins after Titus II rejected an ultimatum that would have made massive concessions to the Thalmor. If you want to see a summary of the war itself, watch the video that Imperial made in the eye icon. But before you do, that video was made before Elder Scrolls Legend, so the information that is missing there, I will mention now. The Old Mary forces somehow managed to drive the Imperials away. The Imperials did well at defending, as you will see in the Great War video if you watch it. They managed to hold the eastern banks of the Nibbin long, but ultimately they were almost defeated in Cyrodiil, and the Old Mary army, under the lead of Lord Narfin, managed to capture and sack the Imperial city itself. Every time the Empire tried anything, they failed. The Old Mary army seemed to know their every move, and the situation seemed very dire. Titus Mede II was in the north, in exile. This is where he met the Forgotten Hero, someone Imperial will also do a video on later. The Forgotten Hero volunteered to go to the Imperial City to try and find out how the Odd Mary armies could predict their every move, and boy, did he find it. The Odd Mary armies of Lord Narfin used a Daedric artifact, the Orb of Vermina, to scry the Imperial army and thus see their moves and learn of their plans. He also discovered Lord Narfin planned to sacrifice every single human in the Imperial City to oblivion to bring about a prophecy called the Culling, in which Cyrodiil would be flooded by Daedra and the Empire would be finally destroyed. The Forgotten Hero managed to lift Narfin's control over the orb and then return to the Emperor so that they could finally attack the Imperial City. Now, finally, with the element of surprise. He also managed to take Goldbrand, the legendary sword of Boethia, from one of Narfin's servants. But Titus Mede II had then been attacked by assassins and was left alive but gravely wounded, almost unable to walk, let alone fight on the battlefield. The Emperor decided that the attack still had to happen, but every second they wasted, Lord Narfin would come closer to executing his plan to sacrifice everyone in the city. He then decided the Forgotten Hero would wear his armour and helmet and coordinate the attack. And so it happened. 
The Imperial Army fought the Battle of the Red Ring under the strategic commands of the Emperor, under the charge of the Forgotten Hero. And without the Orb of Vermina, the Ar Old Mary Army stood no chance against the Imperial Army and were defeated in the Battle of the Red Ring. After this, Cyrodiil was actually largely destroyed, as were the Imperial forces after years of war. Remember that Red Ring were the very last of the Imperial Reserves. All of the others were slaughtered during the time Narofin had the Orb of Vermina at his disposal to predict all their battles. And so, with both, uh, both armies decimated, the Emperor signed the White Gold Concordat, ending the horrors of the Great War in Cyrodiil. As we know, Hammerfell fought on and actually seceded from the Empire. Again, watch my Great War video for more explanation. After this, the Emperor faced a lot of internal strife. First the rebellion in the Reach, after that the Stormcloak Rebellion. We also know from his rule after the Great War that he is preparing for a second Great War. You should actually watch my speculation on the second Great War for that. In short, we know that Second Titus Meet II has been building up the Imperial Army as fast as he could. And that he now is a gigantic force of soldiers camped in forts at the border with the Old Mary Dominion. All to be prepared for a second Great War. We actually hear this from General Tullius when he's asked why the war in Skyrim is dragging on so long. He tells us that they have to recruit locally because the Emperor does not, under any circumstance, want to remove troops from the border of Cyrodiil since it would weaken the superior defenses of the Empire. You know who also knows that? The Thalmor. Guess what? In the Thalmor Embassy there are documents found that they want the civil war to drag on as long as possible just so the Empire might finally draw troops from the border as General Tullius wishes, but as the Emperor knows, is a foolish idea. This suggests that the Dominion is not as strong as they, say, they themselves say it is, but for a more on that, look again at my your second Great War speculation. After this, there's not, nothing more known about the reign of Titus Meet II, but I would like to do some more speculation before ending this already way too long video. My speculation is about the death of the Emperor. I personally think that in the next Elder Scrolls he will be dead anyway, since, well, on one hand he can be killed by the Dark Brotherhood, but what if the Dark Brotherhood is destroyed by the player? What happens then? I will just warn this, it's just speculation of course, but if we take a look at the Emperor Titus Meet II in Elder Scrolls Legends, we can also already see that he has started developing a lot of grey hair, which has me speculating that he was around the age of 50 at the time when the Great War started. This is further confirmed by him in Skyrim, since in Skyrim he seems like a man of around 75 to 80 years old. This means that even if he was not assassinated by the Brotherhood, he will probably have died anyway since by the time that the next Elder Scrolls will be coming out. And the Empire will have been taken over by his son. This son, which is now probably around 40 or 50 years old, with now meaning Skyrim, Presuming the Emperor got children around the age of 30 or 40, like we speculated with the others, will have to lead the Empire through what will probably be the Second Great War. I say this speculating the Mead Dynasty will continue and I think I can make a set pretty sound case for that, since when you have killed Titus Mead II, General Tullius still mentions an Emperor and we hear nothing about infighting in the Empire, but again this is all speculation. Personally, I really look forward to seeing Titus Meet the Second Son actually spearheading the Second Great War. And personally, I hope he wins because I don't like the Old Mary Dominion. But I'm hereby ending this already way too long video. And I'm done with it, so I will end this really quickly. So, like, subscribe, join my Discord, leave video suggestions and feedback in the comments. Oh, follow my Instagram, it's also in the comments. And of course, check out Avarti's channel, which is in the description. Avarti is amazing and super, super cool. He actually wrote this in my script. Nice. Well, actually, I will see you later.